for you today. So, don't go anywhere. Stay right where you are. We'll be right back. and I'm the host of Rob the Inner Circle, broadcasting live from Montreal, Canada. We would like to wish you, each and every one of you tuning in tonight, a very happy new year. And we hope that you still manage some way, somehow, to actually celebrate the holidays in these difficult times. So getting together with family, that's what it's all about. I want to give a huge shout out to the producer of Rob's Inner Circle, the amazing Jenny Duhane. And to the podcast techie here on the show, Miss Patty, Lady Starlight, Sarah Gosa. We have a really exciting show for you folks tonight. We have a very talented musician, a songwriter. He's a bassist. He's from Montreal. You're going to really, really enjoy our show tonight. So you do want to stick around all the way till the end. We have a couple of honorable mentions on our show tonight. Mr. Kylie Stiles, who uh, helped us sign off the year in 2021. He was our guest on uh, December 20th. Well, Kylie had a very nice talk for us. He sent us this beautiful T-shirt over here, the Kylie Stiles Creating My Colors T-shirt. And this is um, in reference to his new album. And he also sent us a copy of his CD right over here. Thank you very much, Kylie, for the very kind and considerate thought. He also left us a little note that I'm going to read out to you. Dear Rob, Jenny, and Patty, I just wanted to say thanks for the great interview and awesome promo on Rob's Inner Circle. It was amazing. It was an amazing way to wrap up my year of music. I appreciate everything you do for your artists. Thank you so much, Kylie, for such a kind thought on your part. There's another name that we're going to be popping up again over here. Oh, my God. It just, she just never stops. She's a machine. She's an institution. Ladies and gentlemen, our good friend, Teresa Pichano, has done it once again. We have now lost count officially of how many awards Teresa has won. So this is... When we put our show together, this was the latest award that she received for her movie. And this is for the Best Acting Ensemble at the Sydney Indie Short Festival. Teresa, congratulations. Like I said, we're losing count over here. We can't even keep up anymore. Our other good friend, Mr. Andrew B., who appears in the movie Mute, well, his movie as well, has won the two awards. One of them is the Best Mystery, and the other one is the Best Acting Duo Award at the Hollywood Blood Horror Festival. Over the weekend, I had a chance to tune in to some, someone really special. It was her first podcast ever. She's an amazing actress. She's absolutely talented, and I was absolutely flabbergasted with the job she did on her first podcast. And I want to give a huge mention to my new good friend, Miss Tina Mancini. You did such a great job. She had such a great turnout. And you know what, Tina? It's your first podcast, but you were absolutely inspiring. So to you, Tina, to Kylie, to Teresa, and to Andrew, on behalf of myself, Patty and Jenny, congratulations. The Daily Struggles sitcom is up and running on the Rise Up TV channel on the Roku streaming service. You can download the app on your electronic devices, or you can get yourself a Roku stick on Amazon for as little as $30. All of the Rob's Inner Circle merchandise is readily available on the 514brandyco.com website. You can get some amazing t-shirts, some coffee mugs, comforters, pillows, you name it, we have it all. We encourage you to go onto the Bobby Short Shorts YouTube channel, and you can go and click onto our playlist, watch our productions, give us some nice comments, want to give us some thumbs up. And most importantly, you want to subscribe 
to Bobby Short Shorts and hit that notification bell because every time there's a new production coming out, you will be the first to know. Well, folks, it's that time once again. It's time to sit back, kick up your feet on the edge of the table, take a deep breath, exhale, let out the bad air, relax, and let us carry the load. It's time to bring on our star attraction tonight. He's a Montreal-bred musician, absolutely talented. He's the type of guy you're going to fall in love with, and we promise. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, here's tonight's star attraction on Rob's Inner Circle, Mr. Mike Marino. Hey, how's it going? Mike, such an honor to have us, uh, have you on our show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. How were your holidays? Uh, quiet, but but good. It was good. It was good. Saw some friends. Saw some family. Got got some good time off. It, it was it was good. Good for the mind. So did you manage to squeeze in a bit of uh, celebration, like just before the uh, the curfew and uh, the moment that they started restricting uh, g- uh, gatherings? Yeah, yeah, I did. I got to see some family and some friends for sure. Just got to take a load off for a little while. It was, it was nice. Well, speaking of family, you are part of a musical family. You, you have like a family that has huge musical background. So can you identify who these famous uh, members musically that you have in your family? Hmm. Well, the one, I mean, I'm assuming the one you're referring to is my yeah. uncle, Frank. So it's uh, Frank Marino from the band Mahogany Rush. So, I mean, I guess many people already know who he is, but I guess for those that don't, he was a guitar icon of the 70s, 80s, up till now, really, but definitely as high as heyday in the 70s, 80s, 90s kind of thing. And he's uh, pretty much uh, considered one of the guitar, great guitar legends of all time, I guess. <laughs> So as you were growing up, what was it like in your household? Like, was it was there music on all the time? Uh, and what kind of music was playing? Well, my dad, uh, <clears throat> my dad always listened to classic rock. He was listening to all kinds of uh, different uh, ba- bands from that era, whether it was Jimi Hendrix, whether it was uh, the Allman Brothers, whether Grateful Dead, uh, the list goes on and on, all different types of uh, bands from that era. Red Led Zeppelin. The Beatles, the Stones, so on and so forth. So at a very young age, you were brought into this musical world. And as a matter of fact, at a very young age, you attended a concert at Jerry Park that you're not about to forget. Yeah, yeah. it was my first concert. I was six years old. So it was my uncle Frank was playing, but he was opening up for uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan. So... <clears throat> I was at Jerry Park in the outdoor place where I think where they have the tennis matches now and whatever. Uh, so, yeah, that was my very first show. I was not really very into the music scene. I was a kid, but I knew my uncle was playing and I knew it was a big concert. So I was excited and I went. And then uh, when I was brought backstage that night after to go see Uncle Frank and everybody, I was introduced to Stevie Ray Vaughan, but um, I didn't know who he was. <laughs> I didn't know. To me, he was just a big guy in a cowboy hat. But it was still, uh, you know, I look back now and I'm like, damn, man. If only I would have been able to appreciate it. But still, it was still a great... I still remember it vividly, regardless, you know? Can you say that that concert is what it is exactly that ignited that flame within you saying, oh, you know what? Oh, man, this is what I got to do. Is Is that concert a turning point in your life? No, well, no. I mean, I was definitely excited about it. I definitely thought it was cool, but that wasn't like, it's not like I went and picked up a guitar the next day or something like that. I was super into sports. I was wanted to be a hockey player for the longest time. But what I really, uh, what I, when I really started getting into guitar was in high school. Uh, at first, you know, because there were so many members of my family that were musicians, I was almost turned off to it. But then as, uh, as I got older, it started to become cooler and more interesting to me, and I started to play. Was there any pressure? Because I know your dad, Norm, was also a guitarist, as you were saying. Uh, and he was somewhat of an influence. But even though he was an influence, was there any pressure coming from your family? That, hey, you know what? We're all guitar players over here. you got to be a guitar player yourself. Mm-hmm. Did you feel any pressure coming? 
not not really for the instrument. I didn't even feel the pressure to play. As a matter of fact, a lot of them were like, don't make the same mistake. Go make money. <laughs> you know? But uh, it was... Uh, no, my dad is, is a guitar player, but he's actually... His first instrument was actually bass. He's actually a bass player first. Uh, however, my uncle Vince was a guitar player as well. And is a guitar player, I should say. Like, they're all guitar players. And I was kind of like, you know what? I'm going to buck the trend a bit. And just another Marino playing guitar. You know what I mean? So it was like, <laughs> screw it. I'm going to play bass. But... Outside of that, that wasn't actually the only reason I chose it. I actually started on guitar, but I actually preferred to to uh, be be a bass player. Like I remember, I was playing guitar at first, and I was like, "Yeah, I, I like this." But then when I tried a bass, I was like, "No, this is what I really like." It just felt right. So from there. Well, normally it, you you do have two less strings to learn. So I guess you know, <laughs> did that play a part somehow? No, no, it was. Uh, Believe me, if you're if you're per, learn bass properly, oftentimes the bass player is doing more than the guitarist. You just don't realize it. But it's just uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of guys get by just following. And uh, so what ends up happening is you follow and you follow. They, you get these root note players, and they, it's cool. They do their job for the song, and that's fine. But I I take like the craft of playing bass pretty seriously. So I got, I wanted to like learn all my scales and how to put a proper bass run and a fill and how to lay down and certain times to just break down into the with the drummer and always be tight in the back in the pocket. But then you also want to be able to let loose and show show your stuff. You know what I mean? So it's, so, uh, yeah. In terms of practicality, when you observe this, the bass and the drum are actually. You were saying one of them is the soul, the other one is the heartbeat in the band. They got to be very, very tight. And a lot of times, if you pay close attention, I know for the viewing audience out there, not everybody's musically inclined, but if you play close <laughs> attention, the bass and the bass drum are quite married together. Yeah, in band, in most bands, yeah. <laughs> um, and, so, you know, it's, I believe that you got to be tight with the drummer at all times. And it's kind of, you, you give the vocals a chance to kind of hover on top. The guitar also locks in with the rhythm, but also has a lot more lead responsibilities. So I think that it's a responsibility of a rhythm section to really kind of hold it together and be super tight with each other. So when we jam or we play a gig or whatever, although I obviously hear everything going on, my I tune in to the drummer as much as possible because I want to be as locked in with him as possible and lay the foundation for the other guys to do their thing. So as a youth, when you were growing up, you said you were interested in sports, notably hockey. How far did uh, did you go in um, in terms of being a hockey player? I did a bunch of minor league stuff. I went to some hockey camps with some NHL players. I did stuff like that. I was, uh, you know, I I wanted to be a defenseman. It was kind of that was like my thing, and I was I did that for years and years. And then one time, you know, high school struck. I started playing instruments, and then. I was like, forget this hockey stuff. What are you doing? You know what I mean? And I, I started doing that. And of course, you know, came with it all the fun and wildness that comes in, especially back then, uh, all the wild stuff that came with being in a band. You know what I mean? So that was definitely something that uh, kind of took me away from I still love sports. I still watch sports. I still get together with friends and play sports, but I don't pursue it as aggressively as I once did. Those days, uh, those days are gone. Well, besides hockey, which other sport were you interested in? I like football, American football, not the CFL stuff. So oh, you don't like the CFL? Can't do that, man. Oh, no. this, 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 <laughs> this C line in the middle, five extra yards. You, the, nah, the end zone's like as big as a neighborhood. I, I can't do it. <laughs> well, they spend a lot of time running. Yeah, you know, it's like three downs. Nah, no, nah, no. Nah. To me, uh, and NFL and NHL, those are definitely my two, uh, two, two sports. So uh, let's take a, a quick shot over here. I would probably guess the New York Giants would be your football team. Negative. I was a Tom, I'm a Tom Brady fan. Oh, okay, the Four Patriots. Goals. Yeah, Patriots, and now the Bucks. Uh, unfortunately, I don't like a lot of the moves the Patriots did the last few years, so I've deferred to the Bucks because they're basically the Patriots of old at this point. And, uh, yeah. There was so I know a lot of football fans hate me for that, but too bad. Because 
seven Super Bowl championships say otherwise. But anyway, that's that's another discussion. There was an incident uh, with one of um, uh, uh, Tom Brady's uh, teammates that he threw his equipment out in, into the crowd not long Recently. ago. Yeah, Antonio Brown. Antonio Brown, and that really uh, um, caused uh, quite a bit of discussion. And and Tom Brady, being the class act that he is, actually defended his teammate, and he says that there's something underlying, the you know, under under all of that. Yeah, well, I think the guy. I mean, he's been. It's happened to him with a few teams. So I think at this point, there's something going on with the guy. You know what I mean? I think I, I don't know what it is. I mean, it's too bad he, he's a very talented player. But he's unfortunately he seems a little bit, a little bit off sometimes, and he goes on these tra- these big tantrums, and nah, it's it's too bad. I think they 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 actually terminated his contract. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I was about to ask you. Do you think his career is over? <clears throat> okay, so in terms of uh, a brand, a base that you use, I'm sure you must have your favorite base. Sure, I do. Um, I've been through them all, including having worked for a major instrument company. But my, I mean, I defer, okay, it depends on the style of music, really. So for like when I'm playing the heavy, heavy stuff like that, it's more like when I play with Born Broken, it's uh, the Ernie Ball music, man. So to me, they're just, they're, they're preamp, their whole pickup, everything about those, they just sound great. They look great. The, we, I use a five string in that band because we tune very low. And uh, so that, uh, that, to me, not, no other bass for an active sound like that sounds as good as that. But in terms of everything else, if I'm doing classic rock, if I'm playing any kind of other genre outside of the really heavy stuff, it's a Fender. Fender jazz bass, Fender precision, more, more a jazz, but I like the precisions too. Those are, those are the standards. You, you can't touch those. I actually recorded metal records, and we brought in like 10 different basses to try out. And we would go through and like, how does this one sound? How does this one sound? Which various brands, various whatever. We ended up recording with Fender Jazz, <laughs> even though it was on a heavy metal record. So that there, there you go. There's also a very famous uh, bass manufacturer, Rickenbacker. Yeah, Lemmy. Lemmy definitely popularized that brand. He's one of the he's one of the main guys. Those are great basses. I've always wanted one. It's actually one of the few brands that's eluded me up till now. That I've never owned, that I've actually I've looked for many times, but they they go for very very expensive on the market right now, and uh, you know that's probably one of the only ones that I still haven't owned. So the, if if ever I was going to go out on a limb to just own one that I never had, it would probably be that. <laughs> yeah. So you've played in several bands over the years. So mm-hmm. let's let's go uh, through the bands you've uh, played in. Uh, let's mm-hmm. start with um, um, Three Mile Screen. Yeah. Tell, tell us all about them, the experience you had with them, and uh, where you've, uh, you ended up with them. Okay, well, that was my first serious band. I mean, I was in little bands around town before that and stuff, but it was just kind of little stuff, nothing serious. Um, so that, that was the first band that I really tried to pursue something with, do a career, go out there and like do gigs, go on tour, do all these things. And uh, we got a good amount of success at the time, uh, we actually got a record deal with an American label, which was called Corporate Punishment, which are were an imprint of Universal Records. So <clears throat> that was a pretty cool experience. We were we were young at the time, and we were like super hungry and ready to tour. And we did. We would go off on the van and sleep in the van and play all kinds of cities, play in the United States. We did all this stuff, uh, running on the road constantly, and we we got to live a lot of that that life and. You know, I don't know how many musicians have been on this show and who've told you what about what, but it's one thing to do gigs. It's another thing when you're on the road touring. It's its own thing, and I could try like We can all try to explain it and tell all these, oh, we have crazy road stories and blah, blah, blah. But unless you've done it, you can't really appreciate it or understand it. So the people that are watching this that have done it, they know what I'm talking about. And it's just, it's not just the gig. It's the whole day, it's the driving, it's the city, it's the sound check, it's the ridiculous situations you find yourself in. It's these stories that you tell people when you get together with people you haven't seen in like 10, 15 years and they're like, well, I got <laughs> my house and I got an accountant. And then you're like, you start telling them about 
when you almost died in some weird city somewhere because of some unforeseeable story you know what i mean and they just kind of look at you like what but it's <laughs> like this that was like commonplace when you're on the road so these are like there's all these different crazy things but it, it definitely it's a it's a really express education in the university of life when you're out there on the road and you do that kind of thing so so that's uh, three miles scream you also played in another band after that which was highly successful as well and uh, weren't you the, one of the founders of Three Mile Screen? Yeah, I was. I was okay. with a guitar player at the time named Alex, uh, me and him as well, and then the vocalist Matt, who incidentally has now become a singer for a very high profile band in the metal genre. Uh, he's uh, he, he was also theoretically maybe not founding, but like within the first couple of months, so I consider him founding, you know. And you also helped found another band afterwards. Yeah, called The Catalyst. So we did a lot of stuff. It was basically a continuation. I mean, it's not the same band, but it was a continuation of what we were doing, the same type of life, the same type of genre, playing the same type of venues. The cool thing about that group was that we actually got a lot of opportunities to open for high-profile bands. A lot of, um, a lot of how could I say, like a lot of promoters and high profile agents really gave us a lot of chances with the catalyst that we got to play some really big festivals, got to play some huge rooms and got to play with a lot of our heroes. So that was a, uh, that was a really cool experience because it was kind of like, it was everything that the first group was, but it was almost on another level in a way, even though we didn't have the same record deal in place that we did. Mind you, as the years have gone on, signing with a record label has become less and less important. It really is not the the big thing it used to once be. So we almost were more successful because we were tied down to a company, if that makes any sense. Uh, right now, uh, if, if you, uh, any artist wants to sell, like produce CDs and sell CDs, it's, it's almost, uh, it, it's very, very difficult because there's a whole bunch of means electronically to download music uh, and, and it's you know very accessible. You, you don't have to go out there to go buy a CD if you want music anymore. Yeah, well, that's it. CDs are kind of finished. I mean, there's always going to be a medium and a, a demand for like physical, something physical. That's why you're having this huge vinyl resurgence right now. But, but uh, in terms of like, as a main means of communication, as a main means of selling music, no, those days are, if not gone on a very long pause, but most likely gone. So right now it's just um, everything's online, everything's digital, it's all downloads, it's all streams, it's even downloads is over. That whole like illegal download thing, that's over. Now it's all streaming. Nobody even really keeps music on their phone anymore. They're just subscribed to a different whatever service and call up songs as they wish. So that's kind of really where that's at now. So if a band wants any kind of revenue right now, the only way to do it really is through merchandising or touring. Pretty much. There's a few other ways you can you can do it. You can kind of get around it by, uh, you know, like there's like uh, kind of simulcast things. They'll do like these uh, live performances, webcast. There's, uh, you know, different little side hustles they can get involved with. But most of the time, if you're not on the road, you're not doing much. That's really, the live show is still where it's at. And put, the last two years, there hasn't been a whole lot of that. So we can, uh, a lot of bands have been struggling and trying to be creative and finding ways to make things happen. And I also think that a lot of people have been recording records. So I think when all the touring resumes properly, there's going to be an influx of new records like you've never seen before. You know, there's actually some good in all of this bad that's going to be coming out somehow. It's just on the back burner in the meantime. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you got to use the time productively. Uh, so yeah, you were in Three Mile Screen, you were in The Catalyst. How about uh, maybe another band before we move on to our, our other subject? Yeah, well, Born Broken, obviously. Born Broken. That's the band you're presently playing in right now. Yes, exactly. So, so they are, yeah. So, I mean, this is a band that I'm not a founder of. Okay. I, so I joined them. They they originally approached me in 2019, possibly late 2018, 2019. Uh, Mike Decker 
contacted me. He's the guitar player. He's the founding member of that band. And uh, I've known those guys for a long, long time. I've known the, the singer Pepe for a long time. The drummer is more new, but he's a great guy. And, uh, you know, I'm just uh, very, very familiar with all of them. And so I, I was like, you know what? I wasn't gonna about to start a new band from scratch again because I'm just not, I didn't have it in me to start that all from scratch. I'd much rather just become a session player at that point. But when these guys call me, I'm like, you know what? I know these guys, I've known them forever. I'm not having to get to know weird strangers. I'm not going to play with guys that are way, way younger. And I'm like, I was just like, okay, this makes sense. So I did it. And it's great because they're great guys. And uh, so far, like with the new material we're writing is pretty heavy, pretty aggressive stuff. I think it's going to do well. So we're, we're probably going to do an album in July, I believe is the plan. But I mean, you know, depending on how all this goes, who knows? But right now I think we're aiming for like a summer time to record a record. Well, uh, I can't wait to hear all about that. And uh, make, uh, make sure, uh, Mike, you keep us informed that we're going to be more than uh, happy to be promoting anything new that you're coming up with. For sure. I think it's going to be really good stuff. Like, we're, we're, we've used a lot of the time. And plus, I think a lot of the, it's a lot of angry juices flowing. So it's going to have to come out on the guitars. This pandemic over here, has it inspired any songs related to the pandemic? I don't do lyrics. So, I mean, that's not the question I can really answer, per se. But I can definitely tell you that I assume many, many records are going to have refer to this in one way or another, or at least allude to it. And, uh, oh, there you go, Born Broken. Um, I was just, um, I definitely think that moving forward, you're going to see more and more albums about this. And depending how the situation evolves, you might start seeing a lot of different viewpoints flying out there. So it's just natural. People are getting cooped up for so long. They're bound to like uh, throw something out there or get like that. You know what I mean? So, but I mean, Hey, if a positive can come from a negative, why not? So if it, if it inspires people to be creative and get their juices flowing on good, like why better, better than sitting around playing, playing PlayStation. You know what I mean? Like, like, um, well, they actually play uh, what's the name of that, um, uh, game on the PlayStation, the, the rock music. What is it? Heavy? Uh, I don't know. Guitar, uh, I don't know. Guitar the rock hero and all that, and the rock yeah. god. And I, I don't, I don't do that stuff. Sorry, man. It's like, it's, <laughs> I, no. I mean, it, it's cool for kids, and I think it's a way to kind of give get music into kids that may have otherwise be too infatuated with their iPhones. So that's cool. But in terms of like, yeah, I'm not going to sit there and play a fake guitar with a handle. And, <laughs> come on. <Yeah. laughs> so this pandemic, I know you said you're not a lyricist, but has it helped inspire, create music that, that blends into the mood of what we're in right now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The new riffs we're writing are pretty angry. <laughs> so, <laughs> there you go. Well, they're pretty aggressive. So, yeah, it's definitely there. You know, and, you know, uh, Mike, Mike has a real... Uh, FTW attitude anyway, and he's a <laughs> and he's the uh, he's the the like Mike Mike's a really good riff writer. He's really really good at what he does. And I I've always said like my strength in writing, and I used to do this with the other bands too, was like arrangements. So like when we sit down and work on songs together, he'll come up with a bunch of riffs, and then I'll sit there. Well, why don't we piece it like this, and why don't we move it? And it's always good to have that kind of interaction and instead of just sitting there trying to have your your univision your tunnel vision kind of this is the song and i see it like this and when you have different inputs like that it's really really good so i so far we've been we've been coming up with some pretty good stuff the heavy metal era has shaped your uh, your past your present and, and your future uh, what is it about heavy metal that really caught your attention why is it that you just like embrace this that genre of music well, it's my age. I mean, part of it is age, right? I mean, I came when I was in high school, it was the metal time. When I was in school, it was Metallica, it was Testament, it was Pantera. It was all those bands that we all grew up, like, all of us of that age group kind of grew up on. And then, you know, it, it predated that that grunge thing. Like we did that, that, that grunge stuff came out. And, you know, some of that stuff was cool. Like, uh, you know, I like Alice in Chains and Soundgarden, although they were always a little bit more of the metal side of that. But uh, 
generally I was just listening to, if I wasn't listening to the classic stuff, like the Led Zeppelins and the Hendrixes and all that stuff, I was listening to like the heavy, heavy stuff. It was on, it was what I was into. And at the time it was like, you know, the music that was going around. And so which bands are the ones that influence you the most? Uh, good question. All you see, I'd say like, when it comes to heavy stuff, you know, I go with Pantera. I would go with uh, Exodus. I would go with Testament. I would go with Megadeth. I would go with Slayer. I would go with Metallica. I would go with all those groups. Um, if it was all time, like if you're going into classic rock and everything, I mean, I, Black Sabbath, Jimi Hendrix, Cream, Led Zeppelin, uh even moving into the 80s, you know, some of the Van Halen stuff. Uh, it really, it's a whole kind of mishmash of all that stuff. But I mean, at the same time, I st I took jazz instruction, so I can appreciate that. I, I played, bl done blues stuff. So I feel like when you kind of take all those different things together, it makes you the player that you are. Well, you talked about blues and uh, the blues king of all times is that you met him uh, when when you were a little boy. You saw him play, actually. Uh, yeah. We're talking about Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yeah. Uh, even today after his tragic passing of that helicopter crash and he died at the age of 40, uh, is he one of the blues players that really touches your heart? Yeah, he well, well, what he did is like in the 80s and 90s, he kind of brought blues back, right? So, I mean, you know, it was up until that point, it was kind of considered old music and it was kind of considered the type of thing that like, oh, you know, uh, Muddy Waters and uh, Buddy Guy and B.B. King, all these guys. And it was this, this kind of like the stuff that the rock guys listened to when they started doing rock. But then he came along and kind of modernized it, I guess you could say. And then from him, you had this whole string of guitar players to follow, like the Johnny Langs, the John Mayers, uh, uh, Kenny Wayne Shepherd, all these guys that came in and it's kind of reestablished blues guitar in a you know, kind of a modern thing, you know? And I mean, at the end of the day, look, even the metal guys, like the guys I listen to, they listen to blues, they listen to rock. Like the, all those guys, the, the Metallicas, the Panteras, like they grew up listening to those bands. So all they did was kind of take those type of ideas, but just present them in a much more aggressive way. And it's that pentatonic scale and the kind of, you know, just all these different uh, variations and voicings and stuff like that, that they would, it all comes from there, man. It all comes from the blues, all of it, all of it. So at the end of the day, anybody that says that it doesn't come from there, they're lying to you. As a matter of fact, yes, I do agree with you very much. I remember uh, reading an interview with Jimmy Page, yeah. and uh, he was saying how uh, Jimmy Page is the guitarist of Led Zeppelin. For those of you who don't know, <laughs> who doesn't know? <laughs> <laughs> Some of the audience members uh, might not know. You know, a lot of times they know the band name, but they don't know the members of the band. Yeah. And he was uh, relating to how blues actually influenced him and how it shaped. Um, the way he's playing, and they also have a song Led Zeppelin called "The Traveling Riverside Blues," yeah, which is an immensely bluesy song. Yeah, for sure. One of my favorite uh, Led Zeppelin songs of all time is "When the Levee Breaks," and that one is like pure bat, like that crazy badass beat that Bonham lays down. <laughs> you got that harmonica with that riff. It's it's crazy. It's amazing. I remember, to this day, like all these Stairway to Heaven fans and everything, it's cool. But to me, when I hear that tune with that crazy beat, I'm like, oh, damn. You know what I mean? Like that's 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 my stuff like right there, a thousand percent. And when you go and you take the Immigrant song, yeah. I don't know how Robert Plants manages to hit those high notes. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know either. Maybe he's got somebody... Uh, Kicking him in the in the nether regions or something. I don't know. There you go. It must be that. There's no yeah. other way. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, look, look, the guy, Robert Plant, you'll say what you'll say about him, but I'll tell you what, he wrote the book on how to be a front man. He may not, I don't think he was the best singer of all time. I think he was good. I think he was, you know, he, he fit the band perfectly, but he wrote the book on how to be a front man. 
And then you have after him, you had the Steven Tylers, and then you had the all these different guys come after him. Uh, they had David Lee Roths, and then into the '90s, and all all these different guys moving forward. But they, uh, I mean, Robert Plant wrote the book. It's like every singer took from that. Even I, we could talk about Mick Jagger, yeah, but I really think that Robert Plant was like the epitome of the front man. He was he everybody after him kind of took. From him. Well, I, I don't see what you're talking about. Mick Jagger, he can't get no satisfaction. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think his I think his bank account's pretty satisfactory. <laughs> but anyway, that's <laughs> they're, they're still well. They were still playing. Charlie Watts, uh, the drummer for the Rolling Stones, passed away not long ago. Yeah, but uh, I don't know if they're still playing. But I know that they're in their mid seventies and they're still playing. They're still going at it. It's yeah, like know. a fifty year uh, history here. Do you think that if we would have told Michael Jackson that Keith Richards was going to outlive him, he would have believed him? Unreal. Because... <laughs> Unreal. I, I don't know how this guy could still stand. <laughs> yeah, I know. For real. Well, you know what it is, right? Is that uh, God doesn't want him and the devil doesn't want him, right? So it's just, just leave him there. You know what I mean? That's like this guy, he's going to outlive all of us. I'm telling you. And there's no room for him. <laughs> <laughs> So you toured quite a bit during uh, the days that you were playing. Um, is there any city in particular that really stands out to you? It could be Minneapolis, uh, no. Minnesota, or anywhere. Like in North America, which city really stands out to this day? Well, I don't know. I mean, like, look, I've had a million cool experiences in Los Angeles, but I mean, everybody says L.A. It's L.A. It's the thing, right? But, uh, I mean, I, you know, I love New York City. Uh, I would say we had a really, I have a really memorable monumental gig at the Milwaukee Metal Fest. Oh. That was a really good one, I remember. And that was a major festival in the U.S. We played to a really big crowd. And we played to a really hostile crowd. Because this was right around the time when uh, that whole Iraq thing was going on. And uh, I mean, if you remember, Canada didn't take part. Oh, I and, see. and so when they learned that there was a Canadian band on the bill, they didn't give us the best of treatment oh. at the time. This is, I mean, I'm going back quite a ways, but it's still. Uh, and we definitely were getting the getting the gears and getting the treatment a little bit at that gig. But we went up there and we killed it. We really killed it. They didn't have a choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm just going to put these people in their place. And then at, at the end of the gig, the whole crowd started singing Oh Canada. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. Yeah, so we won them over, right? And that's kind of like, uh, I know we had spoken off air a bit, and that's kind of what I was talking about, where when you're on the, anybody who's touring will also understand, it's one thing to sit here in Montreal, play some pub, and have like 50 of your friends come out and say, hey, man, great gig. It's another thing to go to a city where nobody owes you nothing. And as a matter of fact, they're looking for reasons not to like you <laughs> because you're on the bill with their friends or their bands that they're there to see, and you win them over. To, see, that's like a legitimate reaction. That's the kind of thing that, that counts when you're on the road. And we used to, I would have that uh, philosophy with the guys. I'd be like, you know, as much as we're here for camaraderie, as much as we may love these bands we're playing with, as much as I'm here to take this crowd. I mean, that's what we're here to do. I'm not here to, like, just hang out. We're here for a reason. And so every night, we would try to do what we could to win the crowd over. We're going to take the audience that night. That's just it's what it was. Some nights were better than others. Obviously, that's the way it always goes. But that's what you do. If you're serious about it and you're trying to make something, you don't want the people to leave that gig and be like, oh, yeah, that, that Canadian man, yeah, they were okay. It, <laughs> Like that's not, you know, you want them to be like, they were going there to see the band from there, and they leave and go, yeah, but that band, man, who who are these guys? What the hell was that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that is what you're going, that's why I'm going to lie on the floor of a van for nine hours. I'm not doing that to just get three three people to clap for me. I'm doing that to make people leave that room and go check out the band. I remember seeing a concert at one time, and this is at the, uh, at the band <laughs> center. Um... I don't want to name the group because I love them too much and I don't want to undermine them, but I wanted to see my favorite group who was the, um, the the main act and one of the backup bands actually stole the show and it's like, 
wow, um, these guys were just fantastic. They were better than my group, put it that way. So a lot of times you get a lot of pleasant surprises when you go to these concerts. Yeah. Well, that's Metallica's breaking point, other than their Black Album, was when they went on tour with Ozzy. Oh. And they opened for Ozzy. And it's notable, like there's even documentaries covering this, that they they were stealing the show every night. Because it was at the time they were up and comers. You know what I mean? And they were trying to make their name and they were just starting to break big. And Ozzy was Ozzy, of course. Everybody, and everybody was paying <laughs> big money to go see Ozzy. But they were leaving, these people were leaving the concert going, who is this Metallic? <laughs> you know what I mean? And, the, and this is like, that was one of the main springboards that got them to the next level. Well, you know, after all, nothing else matters. Yeah. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you're touring, what is the most demanding thing? Because you're away from your family, yeah. you're away from your friends, away from your job. Uh, what, how difficult is it to tour sometimes? I know it's a lot of fun. You get to, to hang out. You meet a lot of people. But don't you get homesick after a while? Uh, homesick, nah, it happens. Occasionally you'll feel it. I wouldn't say homesick is the biggest thing. I'd say the biggest thing is more like you you, you have to learn how to tolerate people. You're you're hanging out there with three, four, five guys daily, and you're, it's all the little nuances. It's like living with a person, right? It's all the little things, and you have to kind of get used to how to coexist. And then you you like what I would do is whenever we would get to a a gig or whatever, I would go out like. If, let's say if the sound check was like we'd get there and sound check was done or sound check was in two hours, I just go take a walk and go check out the town a bit or the city, just get some alone time, you know, and just wander around, stroll around, look at stuff. You got to do that just to give yourself a bit of a separation and a break because even when you're partying and having a crazy time and you're younger, you're just like, ah, everything's after a while, you're like, okay, I need to chill for a bit. So it's a, you just kind of get in a groove when you're out there. And then after a while, before you know it, it's like you wake up and you're like, oh, okay, it's Wednesday. And then you look, it's like, it's Saturday. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just track of time. <laughs> yeah, you just, yeah. you're Because it's not about the day anymore. It's about the town, the gig. It's like, it's, oh, we're in Hamilton. Oh, we're in Prince George. Oh, we're in Calgary. Oh, we're in wherever. Yeah, but where, what day is it? Who cares? It's the gig <laughs> day. It's just another gig day. And after a while, you start getting excited when you have the off days, right? Because then you have like, it's a day off. We get to fuck, we get to run around and go do this and go do that, go to the store, go whatever, like go to a movie. It's, you start looking forward to that because it just, it's, it's, even though it's super fun, there is a Groundhog Day aspect to it. You know what I mean? I'm going to name three bassists, and you tell me what your impressions are. Cliff Williams, Getty Lee, and John Paul Jones. Cliff Williams, super sound, laying it down. You were talking about being tight with the drummer. That guy is like the prototype for that, because that band is the prototype for that. ACDC, I mean, come on. It's like the, Phil Rudd and him are just a clock. Solid, super solid clock. So that's what I would say with Cliff Williams. Getty Lee, well, fantastic technical bass player, amazing player, great, great, just a great musical mind. Not my preferred singer, <laughs> but definitely an unbelievable bass player. And uh, John Paul Jones, to me, and I know like a lot of the Zeppelin purists out there will get super offended. <laughs> he was without a doubt the most talented guy in that band. Because he played piano, he did a lot of the arrangements, he was technically sound, and he was, although the least popular, probably the most musically diverse, talented player in the band. Do you like other forms of music, like dance music, maybe bandstand? <laughs> Let me finish the question. <laughs> you like disco, like hits, like I Will oh, Survive? Yeah. That in my favor, yeah. I, I never <laughs> said yeah, There you go. So I'm taking a chance over here, asking, <laughs> asking a heavy metal bassist if he likes. Yeah, yeah, that's for music. sure. Man. Yeah, we're gonna cover Gloria Gaynor on the next one. <laughs> I don't so, know. That sounds sarcastic. Yeah, yeah a little bit. No, uh, 
No, I'm not really. It's not my thing, man. It's it's cool. Look, I've worked in the business, right? Outside of being a player, I've worked for many years in the business. So I my mind's opened up a lot in terms of in doing that and that I've come to realize there's no accounting for taste. And even though I may not like something and even though I may whatever, I also understand that one person's crap is another person's treasure and vice versa. And it's not like watching the NFL or the NHL where there's a final score and this team's better than that team. It's it really is a music a taste thing. So I can not be into something, but I can understand why someone might be into it. So I know for a fact um, the bass is a very interesting instrument. And when I started liking music, uh, I started off with the guitar and the drums. But then all of a sudden, one day I discovered I really love the bass. And there's one song that did it for me. It's Hotel California. The bass lines in that song are just amazing. The bass is so busy in there. Yeah. And it's, it's not following the guitar at all. It's like it's got a mind of its own. Yeah, I know. It's a really noticeable bass line and it just kind of it drives the song it's cool it's a, it's one of the first songs i ever learned how to play but it's uh it definitely complements the song it almost wouldn't be the song without that bass line you know what i mean so there's bands like that where the bass plays a much bigger role in it than you think and then you know like if, if you go back into the old classics a band like cream jack bruce the monster, crazy bass player. He was much more a part of that band than Eric Clapton was, as much as Eric Clapton's Eric Clapton. It's Jack Bruce. It's the lead singer, and his bass playing was just super busy. He's like one of my main influences, and he's just fantastic. But you don't, he doesn't, even though he was like the main guy in that band, everybody talks about Eric Clapton because it's Eric Clapton. So there you go. And uh, the story uh, doesn't go to say if Eric Clapton actually really did shoot the sheriff. Yeah. Well, he didn't shoot the deputy, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you worked for Ibanez Guitars for yeah. a few years, and that was quite an experience I had over there. Tell us about your experience uh, working at Ibanez Guitars. Yeah. I was there for like seven years. So I was the artist relations guy. And uh, basically, I would sign all the artists. This is for Canada, mind you. They have their obviously they have their artist relations guy for America. So this was for Canada, but I was in charge of signing all the artists, doing all the endorsements, going on clinic tours. I got I got to go to a bunch of Nam shows, which I don't know if people are familiar with those or not, but it's a mega mega music industry gear convention that uh, goes on in Anaheim annually, and basically the entire music industry shows up, whether it's artists, whether it's gear companies, whether it's, uh, you name it, uh, producers, uh, the whole the whole kit and caboodle, the entire industry is there. So it's very commonplace that when you're walking the floor at that convention or at one of the after parties in the hotel, you'll see a super famous person. But the thing is, is it's an industry thing. So it's not like people are running around asking for autographs. It's very kind of like you're there with peers. And you're, everyone's there for a reason. They're there to do business. They're there to make appearances. They're there to do these things. So it's, uh, I got a lot of that cool experience being there. Plus, like I said, going on those clinic tours, which I would manage going cross country. And I got to do that with a lot of big, big uh, artists as well. Some of my heroes. So that was a really cool experience as well. You got, you're a very lucky guy. You got to hang out and work with one of the guitar gods if there's ever going to be another one like him, Steve Vai. Yeah. Talk to us about your experience with Steve Vai. Steve Vai. I did a cross Canada tour with him. Uh, he was doing a clinic tour. Now, for those of us that may be listening, going clinic tour, what is a hospital? It's uh, basically a guitar clinic. is like a giant guitar lesson or demonstration. And they, what are you, they would go to these different music stores, different places to promote the brand, but at the same time perform. They do a Q&A, they do all these things, and then at the end of it, there would usually be a meet and greet. So it's like a giant guitar demonstration kind of thing. And it was it's in corroboration usually with a music store and with the instrument company. So that's basically what, what that was. So I got to go across the country with Steve Vai. I got to go out and eat with him. His wife was with him. I got to 
manage his show on a daily basis, see him do a two or three hour performance night in, night out. It was a really cool experience, man. It's like something that I don't take for granted. And it was just to kind of watch a master at his craft. You know what I mean? It was, uh, you, what ends up happening is that when you work with people like that, that demand a certain level, it just makes you better because it makes you have to work at that level. And then you understand why that level should be the standard because anything less should not be accepted. And when, when, and when you do that and you understand that, and it's not just a talking point, but you really get it, that's, uh, it just kind of changes you and changes your perspective and changes the way you approach things yourself. Not long ago, you collaborated on a project with one of our past guests, Mario Biffarelli, and you can watch uh, this show he was on over here in episode 71, just going to the Bobby Short Shorts YouTube channel, click onto the playlist, Go on episode 71, and then Mario was a guest on our show, an absolutely amazing fellow, a great show. You, you want to go watch that and give us some comments and likes at the same time. And also, uh, he teamed up with you with Mimo Olivero. Oliveri, sorry. Can you tell us about that project, what that's all about? Yeah. So, I mean, the songs, okay, they're, they're two very, very good friends of mine. I should mention that Mario, I mean, I, I realize that you've had him on the show already, but he's a... He, he's at Godin Guitars. He's been at Godin for a very, very long time. And uh, him along with Mimo, and him and Mimo have a history together going way, 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 way back. And they, they toured extensively for like a decade at least, if not longer, and uh, with their group. And so basically they asked me to be a part of this. These are songs that Mimo wrote that Mario co-wrote with him. And... Uh, they're really great songs. They're really fantastic songs. Totally not at all the heavy stuff that I was playing. It's completely much more like rock, blues, kind of. But their original songs are fantastic. They're super catchy. And uh, I laid down the songs, and uh, it was great. I was super honored to be a part of it. And you know what it is? Guys like them, like Mimo and Mario, they're just such a cool hang. They're such cool dudes, and they're such a cool hang that it almost did we could have been covering Gloria Gaynor and I wouldn't have given a crap <laughs> <laughs> because it was just, it's just a cool hang just to chill with those guys. Plus we got to do it at Frank's studio. So Frank was involved and that was just the icing on the cake. Right. And it just, it came out fantastic. It, I'm very excited for it to come out because it literally, it sounds like a pro record. It stands up to the production wise. It stands up to anything. And I'm, and I've heard thousands of albums and I can tell you that this stands up. 100%. There's a, there's a whole story behind the, uh, you know, how this all happened. And sometimes having some audacity pays <laughs> off. And I tip off my hat to Mimo. Remember when Mario was under, so there's Mario right now. Hi, Mario. Thank you for yeah. tuning in. And uh, Mario was recounting that Mimo went up to Vince, Vince uh, Marino, who was in the audience, and told him, hey, I want you to produce our album. And that's how everything started. And you ended up at Frank Marino's place to produce the album or something like that happens. So what's your take on this? Can you recount exactly what happened? Well, I wasn't there, right, at that time. But I mean, from what I understand, the story goes is that when they were touring together, they were in a band called Crystal back in the day, and they used to tour like crazy. And if I understand the story correctly, they were playing at a gig here in town where Vince happened to be in the place. And uh, Mimo, being Mimo, and having no, no qualms about telling people straight, went right up to him and said, I know who you are, and <laughs> we would love to have you record our, produce our record. And apparently Vince readily agreed. So, I mean, that's, like, amazing. And the rest is history, and they became super close with my family for years and years and years. So they're, they're like family, those guys. So to me, it's, it's like, a, yeah. Is there anything that, uh, let's say that, you haven't done today, you have any regrets? Is there anything you would do differently? Uh, anything I would do differently? Um, yeah, I probably would have been the bass player for, 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 for some huge pop artist, made millions of dollars, and then went and been, been the metal guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
no, no. Honestly, no. I don't regret a minute of it. I, if I could do it all over again, I'd do it all over again a thousand percent. Because all the money in the world can't buy you those type of experiences. Are you going to be at the NAM show this uh, June 3rd at the Anaheim Convention Center? If it happens. <laughs> oh, thank goodness it happens. Yeah, if it happens, I might. I mean, it's, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty and all that right now. So if it happens and if, because I'm, I'm currently working for a gear company right now. So if it does happen and if we attend and if all the ifs become yes, then yeah, I will be. I keep hearing stories that there's uh, so much that goes on at the NAM show and people saying, I, I can't even tell you how much is going on. Could you just give us a little bit of an example of what goes on at a NAM show besides meeting some friends and hooking up and signing some deals? What is there to do at a NAM show? That's so interesting. There's a lot of stories I can't tell you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But, I think I have a pretty good idea what you're trying to allude to. <laughs> yeah, but there are definitely a lot of... Uh, no, it's just, honestly, it's a giant... If you've ever been to a trade show or a convention, take that, amplify it by 10, and then give it a rock and roll vibe, if that makes any sense. So it's kind of like... A, but, I mean, it depends why you're there. Some people are there just for the artist aspect, and they go there for the to go to the meet and greets, and they go there to watch the performances. Then there's people like us that go there to actually work. So we're just there to like, you know, I'm there to work and work. And, work. and then after from after six o'clock when the convention part stops and then all the hotel after parties, that's when all the, the craziness goes down, which again, you know, I mean, I'll let you use your imagination. And of course, you make some everlasting friendships uh, at these shows. And I guess that some of the uh, friendships you've uh, formed over there still stand to this day. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely a few different, uh, few few people that I met over there that have definitely are still become very close contacts. And again, a lot of the art, the cool thing is that a lot of the artists I got to work with over the years in the job, some of them have, have actually just become friends. And I text with them regularly, we talk regularly, and it's, I don't even see them as so-and-so artist anymore. Like now it's just, hey, it's so, it's him, you know, or it's Just her. like a buddy, yeah. buddy down the street. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and it's... It's definitely uh, it's cool, man. You, you you get to meet all kinds of interesting people. And the thing is, when you're at that, you meet a lot of like-minded people, people that are into what you're into, and take it as seriously as you do, if not more. Are you a fan of concept albums? I, uh, I know the Pink Floyd, The Wall, they, they, that's a concept album. There's also Boston's debut album. Are you a fan of the whole idea behind the concept album? Yeah, too, as long as the, it's a cool concept. Yeah. I mean, there's a 2112 from Rush. That would be a concept album. Uh, you know, in a more modern... And Justice for All from Metallica is a concept album. I, I could go... There, there's there's many, many concept albums. and If it's a cool concept, yes. If it's a concept album just for the sake of being a concept album, then it kind of... I find it becomes a bit tacky. So it's like, uh, but guys like Pink Floyd and stuff, they usually have something to say. So I can definitely appreciate that. And you were saying that you uh, you were a roadie back in 2002. You were touring uh, with your uh, with Uncle Frank Marino. And yeah, you were I mean, assigned, I'm sorry? You were, you were assigned to the drums. You were changing <laughs> regularly the skins on the drums. Now that's a huge responsibility because if those skins are not tuned right, you can throw the whole band off. Oh, yeah. I know. Trust me, do I know. <laughs> <laughs> so you were telling me uh, stories that you were in a hotel room, like instead of waiting, actually or being on site, you were inside your hotel room tuning those skins. Now, obviously, there's a technique to doing this. Do you have some kind of a gadget that helps you tune the skins? It's uh, called your ear. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but basically, I just... Uh, yeah, I used to sit up in, the, I mean, like, at night when we were in the hotel, I would be sitting there and having to change the drum skins, and I'm sitting there thinking, am I going to spend half the sound check changing these heads? Or I just sit there while I'm watching a movie in the room and changing them that night so that the next day they're good to go, right? I just do a little tweak, and that's it. But it's the kind of thing, like, you know, it's that was part of it, but it's also about getting the drum. We, we had to do a thing where we would set up the drum kit, and I had a carpet, and I had to lay out where all the feet were of each stand. 
so that the exact same replica would happen every night so that the, every night the drum kit was the same right because it wasn't he the drummer wanted to come to his kit and it was the same as it was last night and it's the same it'll be tomorrow and so i literally had to sit there and do like a diagram on the carpet where all the feet of this the snare stand goes here and the bass lug go here and this goes and i did it all like that and it's kind of we, we just mapped it all out so we try to keep it as consistent as possible but i remember one night the pedal the drum the kick drum pedal was coming loose during a song uh oh <laughs> and i noticed it because i'm standing next to the drums on the side stage looking and i see it kind of wobbling and i'm like oh and the drummer's kind of giving me the eyes like help oh, you know <laughs> So I I couldn't just tell him to stop playing his kick drum in the middle of the song. So I I recognized the song and I had to kind of, okay, I know where the kick drums fall. So in between his kicks, I was sticking my hand in and turning the, the tightening the oh my the nut God. And, the, like, <laughs> kick. and if nuts. I would have missed that by like I, my hand would have got squished. Oh you know? <laughs> but it worked. It meant and I was like, okay, this part gets this is the beat. So okay, go. Okay, go. And it was like in the tweet, and it it worked. And you mean nobody filmed this? That's too bad. <laughs> uh, was, there wasn't so many smartphones around in the early 2000s. Well, you, even one of those movie cameras that guys uh, were using to film the concerts. Yeah, I know, but yeah, I know that there wasn't really much filming going on. But I still have the film up here. Uh, <laughs> well, that's one of your great uh, souvenirs from uh, the touring days as a roadie. Yeah, exactly. Mike, this hour has gone by so, so fast. So we got time for one last question over here. Um, in terms of inspiring the young viewing audience that's tuned in tonight, what advice do you have, not only for the young viewing audience, anyone who's playing an instrument and who wants to go out and make a career out of this, what advice do you have for the audience members? biggest thing I could say, and I think this is a thing that's kind of unfortunately gone through all the music schools lately, and a lot of the young musicians get exposed to it, unfortunately, and I don't really agree with it. They look at it too academically, and because of that, they don't listen. When we started playing and we started getting bands together in the garage and we started doing whatever and starting to do our first gigs, we didn't have all these things like to like, and I'm, you know, I know it sounds like some old guy saying, I didn't have that in my day, but it's not, it's not <laughs> even like that. It's, we were, we, we taught each other by listening and we would listen to each other and listen and listen. And by listening, you kind of understand where your place is and how to put the song together and how to work with the other players and how to vibe with another, another player, kind of have that chemistry with another player. Whereas a lot of them now, and I know this firsthand because of the music programs that I've been in and know people in and so on and so forth, they, it's super academic and it's super kind of technical and minded and it's all about like how many notes you can play in three seconds and how many arpeggios and uh, the mixolydians and this. And it's like, it's all fine and good, but they don't, they're too, if you're super busy listening to yourself, you're never listening to anybody else. And if you're never listening to anybody else, the only guy that's ever going to teach you is you, and you'll never get as good, better than what you are. So the best thing you can do is listen. Use your ear and let that guide your hands. And I find if you just do that, if you have any kind of natural inkling or talent, the rest just comes. There's nothing wrong with learning theory and learning your scales. I learned all that stuff, did all that, but it's a tool. It's not the only thing that there is. You have to be able to apply it, but it music comes from your heart and it comes from your ears. It doesn't, this, these are just instruments, you know what I mean? But it's all coming from you. Mike, thank you so much for being our guest tonight. It was so enriching, so interesting, uh, such a pleasure. And uh, please stick around for our meet and greet at the end of the show. Okay. We'll, we'll be uh, coming back to you. Okay. So if you want to sign off with the audience, uh, you got the last word, Mike. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, shout out to the Born Broken guys. Uh, shout out to uh, Limo and Biff. And uh, thanks for having me. I hope to be back soon. Maybe we'll come back when uh, when that, that EP comes out. Oh, by all means, please. Yeah. Yes, I would love that. Okay. S stick around. Uh, Mike will be uh, getting back to you. Okay, thanks. 
Well, there you have it, folks. That was our guest tonight. That was Mike Marino, the bassist in many bands. He's plays, presently playing with uh, uh, Born Broken right now. And uh, it was such a great show. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And just a reminder that this upcoming Wednesday, tune in to the next episode of Noon Hour Out of the Box that I co-host with Esther Brzezinski. And this uh, upcoming Wednesday is going to be July, not July. Why am I saying July? I'm thinking a little far ahead over here. January, January 12th, uh, the, the noon hour. So we're, this time we're tuning it up with uh, outhealth.me. And that's every second week to discuss various chronic illnesses after 40. So this week we meet with Jeff Dennis from the new network, outhealth.me. So you can tune in to watch our show live on the Bobby Short Shorts and Esther's Breeze YouTube channels and on my personal Facebook page. And every Saturday, we're on accessradio.ca. That's accessradio.ca. And we're on there from noon to 3 p.m. So to everyone, thank you very much for tuning in. Next week, we have the Vice President of Chrono Aviation, Mr. Danny Gagno. This is Robert Delasso bidding farewell to each and every one of you from Montreal, Canada. Ciao, everybody.